Hello, welcome to Human Tech, a podcast about the intersection of humans and technology. My name is Guthrie, and today I have with me Dr. Susan Weinshank. Hello, Susan. Hello, Guthrie. And uh, no guest today, it's just us this time. We've been on a bit of a, a guest roll, and we'll have uh, more guests incoming, but... We've been on a guest spree. A guest spree. That's right. Guests incoming. Guests incoming. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling a little silly. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'll get serious. I'll be serious. No, no one likes when we're serious, I don't think. No? Okay. Or maybe they do. I don't hey, really let's, know. let's not forget to tell them the things we're supposed to tell them. How about, why don't you take take that charge instead of reminding me <clears throat> yeah well i shouldn't have brought it up because now i have to say it all right so what yep. we'd like to remind you is that um if you like our podcast then please do a couple of things uh, you can always let us know that's we always like to hear from fans um, but tell other people so they will listen make sure you subscribe so you get it automatically and Please, please, please rate us. Rate us. Give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen because that will help us get more exposure and help more people find out about our podcast. That's that's right. Um, I was never very good with marketing. No, you're not the marketing head of uh, this this enterprise. I just I don't have a I don't have a head for it. Um, but. So here, you know, uh, there's some interesting, interesting news about about the podcast. We have interesting news. Small interesting news. Really? What's that? I don't. I'm not aware of any news. I think our podcast is becoming more popular. I really? Think. Yes. You you're you were looking at the data, the analytics. Yeah, I am looking at some of the data, some of the analytics. Um, so that's so there's more than good. three people listening now. There, <laughs> uh, five there is, people. There is considerably more. Okay, and than uh, and three is it growing? Well. That's the uh, part I'm not sure of. Yeah, no. Well, it is. It is because okay. I have the number of unique visitors uh, okay. by month. I have the total bandwidth by month. Um, okay. That of downloads. It's a little hard because. Um, there are hits, and then there are 206 hits, which are partial downloads. So mm. generally Not the industry, the uh, the, it, well, so a hit means you've downloaded the file. Okay. A 206 hit is a s partial stream, right? So you oh, started okay. streaming it. Someone started and streaming, and then they didn't finish listening or something. Yeah. Well, the industry okay. generally tracks, um, counts both of those as a listen because they like to up their numbers. So I was looking at... Oh at uh, what the industry considers. I could be wrong. Um, so could we count, saying. if people are just thinking about listening, can mm -hmm. we count that? That would might do really good for our numbers. Thinking about it. I don't think that, if they, no, they have to actually have to click. That but if they joke. just click click the play, play button like six or seven hundred times, <laughs> yeah, okay, no, really appreciate it. That's not what we want. No, what we want people to do is actually listen to it, not just click the play <laughs> button a hundred times. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's so that's the that's the extent of our marketing. Woo. So uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. What were you gonna say? My secret. We have um. We have a magical number. We do. Yes. What's the magical number? Well, I, well I'm not. I'm not gonna say what the magic. There's a magical number oh. where it's then worth it for us to put ads on the podcast. Oh. Yes. And you're hoping we, we I I strongly dislike ads and I don't want Yeah, I was going to say our listeners probably if you'd say that then our listeners are not going to like it and no, they're not going to subscribe because they don't want ads. Yes. Well, first of all, I understand all of this and that's why the number is quite high. Okay. Yeah. It's it, so right don't now worry about it. Go ahead Right and now like we're it. floating all the costs and, your and the audio equipment and the bandwidth and the servers and the we're we're, we're just floating it all on our our little lonesome we, I, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, honestly, it would be perfect if you could just like charge a subscription of like a dollar a year, you know, hmm. but what? that there's no way to do that. So the only monetization no, but some, is, ads. you know, some podcasts do ask for, um, 
like donations, but we're not yeah. doing that today. I'm not, and we're, I don't, I don't know. I, just I don't, don't know see, if we're gonna do that. I don't know if we're ever gonna do that. Yeah. The point is, but, is that it's it's gonna happen, but it's not gonna be today or tomorrow or the day after. But if anyone wants to send us money, just let me know. Nah, I. <laughs> I'm please. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, All no right. one should send us money unless it's a large sum. Okay, if someone wants to send us a million dollars, email us at info at theteamw.com and we'll talk. Now, marketing is not the topic of today's podcast. Nope, not even close. So, should we get to it? Yeah, talk about okay. bearing the lead. <laughs> yeah, I know. We just buried the lead. Well, as we are recording this right now, it is the very end of August. Not quite the last day, but very close to the last day of August. And in the U.S., in many locations, the end of August, beginning of September, signals what? Do you know? The uh, uh, the summer equinox. No, I don't think so. It signals the beginning of the school year. I knew that's where you were going, but I was playing down. So this is going to be our back to school episode where we're going to talk about school and technology and learning and all that stuff. What do you think about that? I think it's good. And I have um, lots of good thoughts. So Okay. We well, get going. Um, I would like to start with a Stump Guthrie question. Okay. Fire it at me. All right. So Guthrie. When you are a student, whether you're in high school or elementary school or college or law school or whatever, and it's time to study for a test, is it true that you will do better on the test if you study in an environment that matches the test environment? No. For, ex- for example, if it's if it's very, if the test environment is going to be noisy with lots of distractions, then you should study somewhere where it's noisy and has lots of distractions. If the test is going, if you're going to take the test in a place that's really quiet and you're all alone, then you should study all alone and so on. I'm going to go with no. And you are incorrect. Ah. Uh. The research shows actually that if you study in the same type of environment, same environmental factors. Yes. As which you're taking the test, you'll do better on the test. Well, okay. That I guess I could see that. There are other um, kind of college stories about that that are like this that I don't think they've done research on. All right. Well, I have one more. Okay. One more. St- well, I I may have a lot of stump gut three. That questions was about. That was about. It was like if you study high or drunk, you better take the test high or drunk. You get you get that yeah, state I don't of know mind if recall. They've done research on that. All right, here's another question though. Uh, if you, in in which situation are you more alert and you learn more? Okay, if you are, uh, let's say you're studying. We'll go back to studying. So you're studying, uh, not necessarily for a test. You're just studying, right? Mm-hmm. And you're 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 in a, a coffee shop, and you know there's people am walking I, by. Am I on coffee? A stimulant. Um, no, let's take caffeine. the effect of the caffeine out, out of it. Okay? okay. Yes. So you're just, you're drinking a smoothie or something. I I'm know. drinking a smoothie. Okay. And uh, there's the usual coffee. It's a, it's a, it's a moderately loud coffee shop. You know, you hear some conversation. There's music in the background every now and then. The espresso machine makes that loud espresso noise. Did you like that? My imitation of an espresso machine. I thought, I thought that was, uh, if actually we could have more inanimate object expressions from you on this show, <laughs> I thought that that'd was be really, really good. good. Um, no, I think it can, was would you like to do a dish, dis, uh, a sink uh, disposal? No. Next? Garbage, no. Dis, garbage no. disposal? That they're called? No, no. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> if you are, <laughs> so if you are, that's, that's my impersonation. you know, sitting there working on your paper or whatever, uh, in a in a moderately noisy environment like that, mm-hmm. will that help your studying and your learning, or is it would it be better to be either in a very very quiet environment or in a really really noisy environment like at a rock concert? 
it, it's better in a quiet environment. No. Hmm. It's better in a, actually a moderate a moderate amount of noise. So, I am just going by the opposite of <laughs> everything. No, that that I would do is my yeah. answer because I'm assuming I'm doing ah. it wrong, but it turns out that I'm just doing it correctly. You're doing it correctly. So for example, for example, I like studying with noise. I don't. Yeah. The whole idea of going to somewhere super quiet and studying is not is is not what I personally do. I've never liked quiet study rooms. I like uh, my favorite place to study, at least in college, was at the. Um, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, there's a massive library, and on the second floor, second and third floor of the Helen C. White uh, Library, it is um, it's group study, I guess you could say, and it's yeah. literally when it comes kind of close to finals time, there will be over it'll be a couple thousand students in this library at any given time, and you know there's general thoughts and laughter and studying, and uh, it's that was my favorite place to study was with that background noise. Hmm. And uh, that's that's part one, and then so that's why I picked the answer that was inversed. Hmm. All right, and one last Stump Guthrie question, and then we'll move on to talk about other things. I especially want to talk about tech things uh, and and education. I want to talk. Last... You, you want to talk about tech. I want to talk about tech. Okay, but I have one last question for you. Again, about studying. Yeah. It like let's say you're doing homework. Yeah. You know. Uh, should you be listening to music or not listening to music? Like on, you know, have headphones on and you got your music, favorite music blaring. Listening to music. Only if it doesn't have words. See, that's what I do is I listen to music that doesn't have lyrics. Yeah. Music that has so, lyrics will actually distract you from your homework. It's really bad for me. I remember um, trying if like um, if there's music with lyrics, I can I can study. Yeah. But if there's like a if it's dialogue, like a TV on, yeah, I can't do it every yeah. time because I'm sitting there and it's like, oh hey Jane, right? And I and I just like I can't I can't keep my train it's of too thought. Distracting. It's too distracting. Too distracting for me. Well, there you go. There you go. All right, so now we're going to talk about education and tech. Turns well, out we, I'm a good studier after all you this know, time. There's so much we could talk about, about learning and studying and school and tech and teachers. Yeah, just start somewhere and we'll kind of go. Um, <sighs> we because could probably fill up 10 hours. Let's actually, first of all, um, give our, how, how do you say it? Bona fides? Bon... Oh, I don't know. Um, anyway, our credentials. Oh, of, okay. Of how, how, why, why we are qualified to talk specifically about education. Um, who who would well, like to go first? Well, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, I have a PhD in psychology. And, That's a good start. And a lot <laughs> of what I studied in graduate school had to do with um, education and how people learn so and how people think. And so um, that, you know, I, I actually studied this in grad school. And then I also did some work right after grad school in instructional design, which is the science of how do you uh, organize and present information so that it can best be learned. Um, so I, there's a science behind that, and I, I studied that. Uh, I, I teach, you know, I teach, uh, I've, at one point, um, someone asked me recently how many different courses and workshops, you know, multi-day learning things have you put together in your career? And I was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea. Well, so I, I put together a lot, I mean, you hundreds. You don't just teach. We get, we're talking about especially academia today. Well, okay. Well, I, and I do teach, I, I teach a, a course every semester at University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. So and? I teach college and... Where else end? have you taught? Uh, I don't know. Where you else have ever, you taught? Have you ever taught any college courses anywhere? Well, yeah, I was a professor. <laughs> yes. Uh, but you, not but, for you, very long. I mean, yes, I am a professor but, now. I understand. And I was but... a full-time professor for a short amount of time at the State University of New York. Okay. See, this is this is this is called credentials. This is I've what I'm trying to uh, uh, get at. 
I've done consulting work for a couple of universities. No, no, that's also um, not that. There, you have something else that you've done. Well, that's actually kind of important. But there's also there's something else you've done that regarding schools. I was on the school board. Yes, for for what a day? Seven seven years. Okay. See now, so, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I never sat down and wrote all this time. Yeah, I was yeah. on the, okay. the school board for our local public school. I think that's good. Okay. So that's so that's a that's, that's and a, not to mention that I went through all those years of schooling. Right. So. Oh wait, wait! I got one more. Oh okay. When I was growing up, we moved approximately once a year. So before I graduated high school. I had been to 14 different schools. It's amazing. And I didn't go to kindergarten, so that didn't even count. Starting from <laughs> first grade through 12th grade, I was in 14 different schools. And it's not because I was getting kicked out for being, you know, bad. Uh, it's just that we kept moving. So um, so I've seen a lot of schools. Okay. Too. All right. Now, your credentials, Guthrie. My credentials. So hmm. obviously, I have uh, less credentials than you do. That's uh, just because you're younger. Yes, it, that is a function of my age. Mm -hmm. I've obviously gone through lots of school. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, uh, undergrad, uh, obviously um, the K-12 and law school. While I was in law school, um, I did a bit of, uh, I did a considerable amount of research about the current state of education, uh, especially in Chicago, um, where that has the famous CPS, Chicago Public Schools. Um, that's always in some sort of minor disaster or another. Um, the state of Chicago public schools is quite grim as about um, this is a very segregated system and the public schools in general, uh, a lot of the schools have graduation rates of under 50 percent. Um, wow, so, that's bad. Yeah, so well, that's the, that, that is not, they have higher quote graduation rates, but they're false, right? The, the, graduates, the graduation rates that are often posted are what percent, pe percentage of seniors graduate, but a much more accurate number oh, is what yeah. percentage of, of the incoming freshman, freshman class freshman will graduate. obtain a high school diploma. And it's that's often, less than 50%? Uh, I think that actually, it might be less than 50% all together in CPS, though I'd have to do some research. Wow. I, um, I was in a program called Street Law in which um, they, t they, they team law students up with um, teachers in uh, not the best schools in Chicago to, um, to teach uh, various law classes to the kids. Um, so that was really exciting. I did that for a year, so for um, once, a, uh, once or twice a week for many, many weeks. I'd go to um, Sullivan High School, which is... Mm -hmm in Rogers Park, and I'd uh, teach um, a, a good group of kids, uh, and uh, about- What were you teaching them? Oh, well, it was it was in conjunction with the with our teacher, and she was really great. I believe her name was Yvette Gonzalez, if I remember correctly. She was the high school teacher? Yes, um, and, and I don't know if she's still working there. There were um, budget issues at the time, and she of had course, a master's- yeah. Well, she had a master's degree, and so so they were paying her. They had to pay her too more. Much. Yeah, so so I'm not sure how that all worked out. Yeah. But she was wonderful, and she kept the kids in line. This the class I got happened to be mostly um, juniors and seniors. So yeah. these were the kids who were going to make it, right? Yeah. Um, the yeah. most most of the kids who weren't going to make it had already dropped out at this point. Um, yeah. Sullivan High School. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of an amazing school. Rogers Park is the most diverse zip code in the United States. Um, yeah. Uh, though uh, Sullivan High School, you know, has a very, very small percentage of uh, white students um, just as a cohort and by small, even though the neighborhood is maybe like 30 percent, it's like 5 percent of the school. I, I could I could break up. I, I, I did lots of research on all these stats. Um, it, it's yeah, I mean, just it's it's hard for people who are not familiar with um, inner city school districts to really kind of understand the problems and challenges and miracles that they uh, do on a daily basis. Um, so like, um, so like in Sullivan High School, I think uh, if I remember correctly, um, about 20% of the kids uh, legally don't have parents. They are really, yeah, they're wards of the state. Um, so, wow. you know, it's so hard to get foster care. Or yeah. Like it's that. hard to get a kid to, you know, read Shakespeare and care about, you know, finishing homework when you got to worry about other foster kids beating you up or what you're going to eat or, I mean, there, there are yeah. real problems in the system. So, um, so I got a good bit of hands-on experience, uh, plus uh, the research, uh, that, that I've done. So that's, uh, that's, that is my perspective 
uh, we have your uh, more uh, t traditional academia background. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I just, so now people know. Now people know. What our biases and uh, yeah. our, our soapboxes. So, technology and schools and education and learning. So do you do you have you have a particular topic you want to talk about? I know a lot about technology, so there's there's that. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, just just pick one and we'll we'll run with it. All right. Well, let's talk about um, let's we'll just start at some basic stuff. So, what do you think about? Uh, you know, I know I I don't even I I think we've moved on from iPads, but you know it's been popular in the last couple of years in the area that I live in, which is central Wisconsin for some of the school districts that when kids enter like middle school that everyone gets an iPad mm -hmm. and then you know lessons are all delivered uh, on the iPad or you know Chromebook or whatever it is mm -hmm. so um, they they've, they're doing away with textbooks yep and they're also moving as they move to this they're moving to aware of a certain amount of time uh, in the subject area is spent the student alone with, you know, their iPad or their Chromebook mm -hmm. um, taking the, the lesson on the topic, let's say math or whatever it is, rather than the, you know, typical teachers in front of the classroom and giving a lecture and that kind of thing. So what do you think? I personally, I like it. I mean, obviously I'm very pro-technology, um, I draw from my own personal experiences, which was being incredibly bored in all of my classes, basically kindergarten through law school. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, most of the time... That's pretty bad. Uh, it, it is what it is. I'm a very fast learner. Uh, I get concepts quickly. Um, I'm bad at memorizing stuff, so if there were things that needed to be memorized, you know, I'd have trouble. Um, and... Uh, you know, law school is maybe a different animal and maybe even college to some extent. But um, a lot of times, um, if you get the concept, you get the concept. So I spent a lot of time, for example, they were like, read this chapter. And I would read the whole chapter in about five minutes. Um, and the kids around me would still be reading. We'd have 40 minutes left. So I just finished the book because I didn't have anything else to do. Um, and you know, like, and finishing reading, like the next four chapters would be like that week's homework. So it all kind of worked out, but you know, so, so the idea of getting your work done quickly and learning it, and then, you know, maybe taking a test to validate your learning and then using your time for more productive means, um, is smart. Um, but that's okay. But take, you put that aside. That's my own little personal anecdote. Um, what I really... I think it's a good idea just um, because uh, I've talked to a couple teachers about this mm -hmm. and if it helps them teach, then it's worth it. And uh, for what I've heard from the friends of mine who are teachers mm -hmm. is that a lot of kids learn in different ways. And there are a couple kids who just need a help in one place or another. And, and so by basically having an electronic instructor Mm -hmm. It frees up time, resources, and energy for the teachers to focus on the kids who need help and allow the kids who get it to kind of breeze through. And so what you end up getting is you end up getting better results because you're pulling the kids up from the bottom as well as maybe pushing the top tier kids a little further than they'd get if you but have it to does mean in that move situation, everyone at the same speed. It does mean that the top tier kids are not getting near as much teacher interaction time correct they're not getting as much teacher interaction time but it doesn't mean they're necessarily getting less learning because they might be able to go through more of more of lessons or more whatever in theory they could learn more well all right not so let's, goof around, let's even take this to totally just goof around let's take this to an extreme yeah or a little more extreme yeah so let's say we go this route let's say we we say look we're gonna we're going to have, uh, you know, individualized instruction delivered via te this technology, and the technology is, is doing exams and, you know, exercises so we're, we're sure that the kids are understanding and, and so on. 
the teacher is there to facilitate it. The teacher is there to provide inspiration and to help anyone if they're having trouble with something. Then why have a classroom at all? Yeah, and it's and it's a it's a good question, and a lot of what we're going to be talking to really dives into what is the fundamental uh, nature of education and what mm -hmm. is its purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so there's a couple thoughts. First, the most important part about education has nothing to do with what you learn in the classroom, um, which may some people may disagree with out there listening. Probably a lot of people do, um, but it's about uh, um, adapting socially, um, interacting with other people, developing social skills, uh, developing strategies for learning. Um, and that's the, that's the real benefit of fourth grade. I mean, what, you know, think back to your high school days. Let's not talk about college, but let's specifically talk about high school mm -hmm. or middle school even, okay? There are certainly things you learned that are important that you use on a daily basis. Um, the vast majority of it is not, you know, does not influence you on a normal basis. But think more to your experiences you've had with friends in high school. Um, I feel I feel like those are, you know, those are also those are very very important as well. Um, so I think. So, so maybe maybe the education is still more more important. I could see that, but the point is that there is a value to having a bunch of kids in one place, in a physical place where they can learn to be social, and it 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 allows them to get out of the their parents' house, and it allows them to have us uh, make friends um, and and be part of something, but also um, they're learning how to study, in theory. Mm -hmm. Um, which if you're by yourself, maybe you can't, but being, you know, locked in a room for a bunch of years where someone is literally watching you to make sure that you study is incentive enough to, to do so. <sighs> um, also, I know the research on uh, uh, school programs that are entirely um, internet based mm -hmm. and it's not good. Well, the other thing I, I think that, that has to be factored in is you know besides and i agree with you about the the social aspects and socialization and that, that i feel is like i did a bad of job of that question i don't I think so i i feel like i feel like i would if i if i could if i could do it again i would have done a more succinct job okay but you not you don't get to do it again unless you want to do a bunch of editing of this episode and you oh, we're not i was just i was just i was just saying <laughs> i felt like that was a juicy like you lobbed me a juicy softball and i kind of <laughs> I kinda kinda hit like a grounder to the shortstop that maybe went through the gap but like i didn't i didn't really yeah but I, there, there's another piece of this too though i mean so if you think about um you know what constitutes uh learning okay Mm -hmm. So, so first of all, I think we have to separate out the socialization factors from the learning content factors. Somewhere. Okay, you can't totally separate that out, but uh, you we can artificially separate that out for a few minutes and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, sure. So you you know the socialization part I think is very important. Uh, learning to get along with others, learning to get along with people that are like you and people that are not like you and that share your interests and don't share your interests and people that learn some things faster than you and learn some things slower than you and so on. Um, and and you learn that in school. Sports uh, and music and... And even just in the arts. math classroom. Yeah, sure. Uh, you you sure, just, sure, you sure. know. So um, there's that. Uh, there's... But the content part... Uh, you know, if you so if you take out the socialization part and just focus on the content part for a minute, so you're trying to learn arithmetic or calculus or biology or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is that component of you know just just learning con and, and we could go. I mean, if it, don't get me going on my instructional design rant, because then I'll be talking about the differences and if you're teaching facts, concepts, procedures, and uh, principles. Because there are four basically four <laughs> types of information, and which, yeah, and how you teach them depends on which one it S is. So, and that's another thing I want to sort of avoid, 
I, cause I thought, <laughs> no, no, just in, in all honesty, because like, especially when it comes to education and what should be the educational priorities of yeah. a school, that's a yeah. very controversial topic. And yeah. I feel like, here, let's just spend uh, 30 seconds each just okay. saying what our own personal preference is about okay. a, from the, from a content perspective of what um, public, uh, schools in the United States should be teaching just from a content perspective. Would you like me to go first or would you like to? I'm not even going to answer that question. Oh, really? Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it for like 20 seconds. Go ahead. I'm and then, and just just so we can like put it on the record and then move on right. and then you don't have go to ahead. feel like move. Okay, um, I think uh, it's pretty simple. I think the co content should be obviously SETI based, right? So the science, engineering, what is it? Technology, no, what's whatever, STEM. <laughs> I don't know, I forget, I for you know what I mean? Sides of math. Um, science and math, yeah. And, and problem solving. I think problem solving is a really, 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 really underrated skill, yeah. you know, in law school, they teach you they the first first day of law school is like we're not here to teach you about the law. We're teach we're here to teach you how to think, mm -hmm. and how to solve problems. And it's like, well, that's so funny because ever no like everyone in law school is like an English major, or like a p philosophy major, right? Um, yeah. And but and really, what you need is you need problem solving skills. So, um, you can do that at a very early age, and you can do that with all kinds of science and, and math based stuff. If you want to teach P I, I, the, uh, English and classics, I'm not so much of a big fan of. Of course, I'm a miserable speller and did horrible in English my whole life. So, actually, I did really. I got really good we're, grades. In we're going to get people writing in about this. I hope so. This well, this is why I just wanted to do just like 30 seconds on it because mm -hmm. there's no there's no right way. Um, but 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 I think uh, having people be creative and artistic and being able to express themselves is very important so mm -hmm. so combo the math and science and problem solving with a little bit of philosophy especially if you want you know west you know of however you want to do it just so that people can understand that you know uh, like shakespeare right it's in a it's in the context of kind of western civilization and what that means and then also um expression time right um so creative writing or creative drawing or just any way that, that that kids can be themselves and express who they are and feel comfortable doing so and figuring out how to have an outlet for their thoughts and ideas. So that's um, that's that. And also, I like Jim. OK, we totally disagree on this. So I, I, I <laughs> no, totally I think this is and this is what I said, because because I just wanted to get this out of the way because in, <laughs> no, no. But in all honesty, there really is not a right answer. Right, because here, if like um, so, for example, uh, my aunt, right? She she teaches um, out in California, and she teaches for a school that focuses mainly on the, the classics, right? So Western yeah. classic literature is yeah. really what they do. They don't use computers, and they read, you know, les les miserables, and like the you know everyone's learning Latin, and yeah. you know it, that. that doesn't necessarily make the kids smarter or dumber than if they're learning engineering, right? I personally think that learning, having a healthy dose of um, science and math training will make America more competitive in the global economy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, it's not like a right way or a wrong way for content to educate kids. That's just my personal preference. Everyone has their own personal preference. That's why, um, you know, people, kind of want to be in the school they want to be in. So in what ways does my preference differentiate from your preference? I'm not even going to go there. Okay, fair enough. I just want to talk about... Well, that, uh, that's what I'm saying. So so now that we've done that, now that you've we're done drawing that, a line in the sand. So let's talk, about, let's talk about because learning Because what I was going to say is, yeah, d despite what content you're learning, mm -hmm. okay, no matter whether you're learning Latin or... Uh, well, I don't know. Latin might be different because it's a foreign language, and that that has its own that has its own thing about the brain. But um, you know, whether you're learning math, whether you're learning philosophy, whether you're learning history, biology, right, whatever. Right, right, right. Um, in addition to the learning the facts and and background uh, principles that you would get from that individualized instruction on the computer that mm -hmm. we were talking about. Mm -hmm. You've got to have um, 
as situations where you can practice what you are learning beyond just answering questions on a computer. Yes. Yeah. And so that's the other aspect. So if we have a lot of this individualized instruction, we have to also though have, you know, like the, it's usually done as a project based learning. People have the the students have to have uh, a time when now you know whether you put away the computer or the textbook or whatever you know or whatever or the teacher shuts up whatever however you are learning it they now have to have a time period where they have to take what they were learning and and apply it on uh, on their own and I don't mean necessarily alone in fact they'll do better if they're doing it with a small team yes but they've got to go do it so that's the only thing i got you know that's that's i want to really critical agree. and in any situation in any learning situation uh you know in in instructional design terms um we used to have a little phrase which was uh if you haven't built in that practice time you know the the exercise time for them to practice what they've learned, don't even bother including it in the curriculum <laughs> because <laughs> they're not going to remember it and they're not going to learn it. So, um, yeah, I, I'm thinking specifically back to uh, my good uh, calculus teacher. Yeah. And the most effective way that I personally learned was what we do is he'd give us homework. Um, and then at the end of and it was, and it was, you know, it was a decent amount of homework. But then at the end of class, we had um, block scheduling, so we had uh, what is that, f uh, hour and a half per class. We so we had four classes, four blocks mm -hmm. a day, hour and a half mm -hmm. instead of your um, your forty five minute blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, we we learned something, and then the last half an hour, uh, we we break into groups, right? Right. So you pick like groups of three or four mm -hmm. of just your buddies, mm -hmm. and you'd all do the homework together. Mm -hmm. And it was great uh, because if you didn't know what you were doing, you'd be like, wait, how would you do that? And then the other person would be like, oh, yeah, you just do this thing. And you'd be like, oh, OK. And then if you didn't get the homework finished in class, then you had to go home and finish it. But by that point, you'd already done a bunch of the exercises, a bunch of the homework questions, and you'd already understood the concepts. So you were reinforcing at home, but mm -hmm. after you already had the group work. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, the best and the other thing idea, that's I important that about that group situation is that we also know that when you have to teach something to someone else, that's when you really learn it. Yep. So having the opportunity then to to have students be the teacher mm -hmm. is uh, probably one of the most critical things that we can do. So let's actually let's take this moment to talk about something that Edgar is trying. Edgar, Wisconsin, where I live. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, because they're they're doing a little bit of an experiment in whatever grade that was. Do you know Do you know what I'm talking about? I think it's fifth, three, four, five. Yeah, third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe do you you might do better describing it than I can. Well, you're talking about where they, instead of having, um, you know, two classes of third grade, two classes of fourth grade, two classes of fifth grade, which right. is what they usually have at the Edgar School. This is a very small school. Very, by very the way. small school. Yes. Um, they they took they did that with one group, third, fourth, fifth, did the usual thing, but then they created um, a third, fourth. They created classrooms that were some kids were in the third grade, some in the fourth grade, some in the fifth grade. And I don't think that necessarily, what really matters is the class size. Because Was how... Was it different? Well, do you could continue, because maybe, maybe I misremembered. Well, and then they, you know, they did away with the regular uh, desks and chairs. And everything went to, they had a big room, everything project-based. They had different, you know, work table areas. And... Uh, you know, you'd walk in there and, you know, it, there'd just be people all over, kids yeah, so, all over doing, so, doing work on whatever they were working on. Now, the teachers knew what was going on. Um, but if you just walked in the room, you'd go, oh, my God, it's, you know, nobody's <laughs> in charge here. So the, the difference is instead of having, you know, 25 kids in, with one teacher, with one teacher in a classroom and these kids doing everything together, 
mm-hmm. um, it was the same situation, except uh, that really the, the, you're not you as a kid. It's a very different experience because you're you're you wouldn't you actually don't have a class of 25, right? You have a class of 125, right? Because you have all these kids in together. Um, and then you I think then, actually it was 75. 75. Okay, if if that's what's ever manageable. Um, and so then you have this, but then you have multiple teachers. Right. Right. And, and, and so you kind of yep. do in these different pod things. Yeah. Um, I thought this was great. Well, this, you know, I actually have a, a friend who did this and this was, um, well, there was a little, all right, here's a, here's a, here's a computer school story. Yes. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, I had a friend who uh, he and his wife were both teachers. And they did this. Now, we're talking about decades ago. Mm -hmm. They did the exact same thing. Uh, And they had done it for years and years and years. And the other advantage of this, by the way, if if you do it over a long time period, is that you get each kid for three years. Right. You get them in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Right. Um, So you get to know them. Uh, which and, could be an advantage to or know disadvantage. You. Yeah, which might be good if they like you and you like them, and might be bad if you if it's not a good fit. But you get to know them. Also, of course, you have the kids being able to because you've got three grades in there. You know, if a, if a child is moving along quickly in one subject area, they can do that. That's not a problem, right? But um, uh, this was they were doing this pre technology days. Uh, you know, so the kids were not doing individualized learning on computers. Now, one th- interesting side note, though, about computers is this was back. You you don't remember this technology, but you may have heard of it or seen pictures. Maybe you saw it in a museum, an Apple IIe. <laughs> have you ever seen pictures of an it's, Apple IIe? By the way, they recently sold an Apple I Special Edition yeah. for $825,000. Why didn't I hold on to any of this technology? Oh, you want to tell would, me that? I don't know. You would have been so rich. So um, they had, uh, this This was very advanced. This was amazing. They had like three Apple IIe computers in their classroom. And this was unheard of. Unheard of that anybody had computers in the classroom. And and they didn't, so they, I, like somebody had given it to them or donated. I don't know how they had them, but, you know, they had, and they didn't know what to do with them. And so they were just sitting there. And I said, well, how about if I come in twice a week and I teach the kids, and again, this was third, fourth, fifth grade, uh, how to do computer programming. And and they were like, what? You can do that? And this sounds like some sort of super, super fancy Silicon Valley, (laughs) like, like, right, like in, uh, like somewhere in, in Silicon Valley. This was in upstate New York. Yeah, no, I know. But it sounds like it's like, Silicon Valley, like college prep school that like all yeah, no, like this the Forbes the pub- billionaires this would send was their the kids public to. School. This was public oh, school in great. Hamilton, New York. It's great. So what I did was, and back then I, I'm there's I'm sure this, this kind of thing is still around. In fact, not too long ago, I was looking it up to see the, the program I used is not, I think it's gone through some iterations, but so, so there's some versions of it, but it's not the same, but it was called Logo, L-O-G-O. Um, and uh, it was this wonderful little tool. Now, Apple IIe's, they, uh, green screen, okay, uh, no color. No, is, this is not a graphical user interface, okay? This is a character-based line interface. Um, and so, but what you, what you would do, the way you taught programming with this, and I think this, I got this from um, Cheryl Turkle from MIT. Uh, is, I believe it was her group that came up with this. So the idea is that on the screen is a little little character. I mean, it's all—it's just made up of like asterisks, you know, and L's because there's it's not it's not a graphical user interface, but it's called a turtle. Okay, I mean, it doesn't really look like a turtle, but it's called a turtle. And so what you do is you could teach the turtle to do things, and and the turtle didn't know anything, but you could teach. You could write. You could type in a command that w- and the turtle would move to the right you know four spaces right and then you could 
have them move, type in a command and have them turn, turn 90 degrees and then have them walk three spaces, right? And then you can have them turn to the right, right? So you could, mm -hmm. you could move the turtle with command lines like this. And then you could then teach the turtle, you could, you could get, group that together and call it, you know, rectangle or square, right? Or triangle if you, and you could, and then you would have taught the turtle not just how, how to move to the right, but now you, you could just type in squ turtle, you know, square four, and the turtle would draw a square of four pixels. So, um, of course, what you're doing is learning about programming and recursive programming, and, you know, you, you're learning programming skills, but the kids thought what they were doing was, you know, make the turtle move. Now, remember, this is pre- computer games so this was exciting mm -hmm. you know nowadays it may not be exciting i don't know but one of the things we had and and these kids were learning pretty i mean by you know by the end of the year they were doing some pretty pretty amazing things with variables and you know all kinds of programming stuff um one of the things we used to do because sherry cheryl sherry not cheryl sherry turkle said to do this in the book i read um is before they programmed the computer, they had to walk it out. So they, you know, they'd be working in small teams, and they'd, you know, one of them would be the turtle, and then the other one would say, you know, uh, turn right, and then he turn right. And so they would, the, whatever design or graphic or drawing they wanted to create, or whatever commands they wanted the the turtle to learn, they would first do it in physical space with their bodies. And then they would sit down and do it uh, with the computer, which um, I, I also want to talk about because I want to talk about uh, something called kinesthetic learning. So uh, it was really fun. It was some of the most fun teaching I've ever done. And, and I don't know what happened to those kids. You know, one of them is probably like running a startup company or something. So, okay. So... This is technology genius. I've been, you know, yeah, we should, we should, that's why you should teach, um, you know. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are more inventive ways to use technology in a classroom. Yes. Than just to have it show a picture. Yeah. Show some words, ask a question when you press the button hey it goes da, 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 we've, da, been, da. we've had chromebooks you are correct. we've had we've had even though we've had a lot of technology we've had students having individual chromebooks in the classroom for like five years like it's really new so give it another decade for you know the older people who are actually coming up with really really cool ways to teach kids stuff some time to figure out how to use this. Yeah, best. but I want. All right, but I have a question for you because you know I teach at the University of Wisconsin, right? Yeah, and then and then I want to talk about some other stuff, or just right. because you. But back to the, I'm not done with the the third oh. grade. Thing. Well, do you want to go back to the third grade, or do you want me to yeah. ask? Yeah, well, it's up to you. I don't care. Uh, go ahead. I'll ask my question in a minute. So the other reason I thought this kind of interesting larger group structure um, yeah. might work really well. There's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of research in a lot of different ways, and I am by no means an expert. But um, there, are, first of all, there's some research suggesting that the achievement of a certain group of uh, a certain class group is very strongly affected by the, I don't know how to how to say this, the number of kids who are disruptions in the classroom, mm -hmm. because I mean, in Edgar, like. It's a small farming town. Everyone's, you know, most of the most of the kids are pretty nice. I mean, I, obviously some of them are little terrors, um, but you know, they're most of them are coming These from. These kids are not growing up with, you know, in foster care post -tra or post traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, exactly, like a lot of kids in the U.S. are. Exactly, and so mm -hmm. what might work in some of these neighborhoods mm -hmm. just may not work may not work in, in chicago. chicago yep exactly mm -hmm. well one of the interesting things about this kind of um i don't we should give it a name do you want to call it like the the uh, group learning yeah let's just call it group learning group learning um group, group slash computer learning group is that learning. is that you can then um figure out really creative ways to 
keep the it's um for from what I understand, it's kind of like a um a, like a it's 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 like a cliff. Like if you have a certain percentage of people who are distractions in the class, like as it, it's it like it grows the the like product class productivity just drops exponentially once you get hit at like a certain level. That's just more than what the teacher can you mean handle. if you are not in this group class? No, no, no. Or I'm just, I'm just talking just n- normally, right? So in let's general, say, yeah. Yeah, if you have a group of like 25 kids and one of them yeah. is a troublemaker. Right. Okay, but then if you have two, if you Three, have four, four five, if you have right. six, right. if you have eight, and there's like a certain level you get right. the when, then, when then it starts disrupting learning for other students in for a significant everybody. way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in this larger context, um, you can do creative things to keep uh, the level of uh, uh, kids who need special, like a, a more a more uh, attentive hand, I guess yeah. we could say, or kids that uh, would would distract others who who yeah. may be who, who who would do worse because who do worse because of the distractions. Yeah. Um, you do creative things to keep those levels in check, even in schools that may have very significant levels of kids who need. Um, uh, uh, the helping hand from teachers, yeah. right? So you can take um, a group of, of, uh, and and I'm not saying I know the right way. I I am I certainly do not. Um, but you but it, it allows you to do creative things like, for example, having um, a group a smaller group, right, of six or ten kids who might you know if they're individually in a classroom of you know, and that's the other thing, right, in these kind of. Uh, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's underfunded schools in Chicago. It's not like you have 14 kids in a class, right? right? It's like 25, it's 35. Yeah. It's it's a yeah. huge class with one teacher. Um, yeah. So if you can then, you know, you have all these little pods. Well, maybe you have a pod of, of 30 kids, but they're, but you know, the, the kids are kind of mostly, mostly all right and they need some work, but something that a teacher can handle. And then you take maybe the two or three from each class that would have made it really, really difficult for um, a teacher in this situation to handle together. But by putting them in a group of eight, for example, yeah. then instead one teacher can of, handle the eight. And then you yeah, can, instead of a group of 35. Yeah, so you can get better mm-hmm. results even mm-hmm. by keeping your teacher-student ratio um, in check, mm-hmm. just as a, as a simple example. Or it, it allows you to balance out kind of on the fly um, group specifically, right? So if one kid is having a bad week, right, you can kind of have um, him or her be in a different, you know, section for that week or do something else or because because it's in a wide open, you know, classroom right. or change up the teams or you, there, you have right. more flexibility you have than when you're literally just in one room in the same yep. spot, not moving right. all day. So right. I, I, th- I think it has just a lot of potential and it, I was very intrigued by it. Um, do, so do you know what one of the problems is that's turning up what they get out at the end of the fifth grade and they have to go back into a regular classroom <laughs> yeah. and is and isn't that and that's a problem and isn't because... that a like isn't that really like a problem that's actually <laughs> like a good you know this is like a backhand i don't know it's a problem and it, i think it's it's probably mostly a problem for the teachers in the other grades. I think that's yeah. proof that it's working, that the kids like that other format so much. I mean, it's a much more human and natural way to learn and exist and be social than... Than sit in one, in uh, one spot. In and, one spot for yeah. hours and hours and hours yeah. a day by yourself while someone lectures at you. Um, so Well, which... I, and, and, and coming to the defense of teachers, I, I think there are many teachers who are in the regular model that do not have their students sitting in a desk for hours and hours and hours. True. But there's definitely is more individuals sitting. Uh, you're giving you know. the te- you're ju- all you're doing is in yeah. that situation is you're giving teachers more tools at their disposal to be. I'm teachers sure and if to we teach. had a, if we had a teacher uh, come on the podcast, they would. There are teachers who are probably at this point listening and tearing their hair out and going mm. no 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 but yeah, um you're probably all right. right now here's my question for you though okay so that was that was my i, I yeah, just thought it was yeah. interesting oh yeah. and one last thing yeah everyone should go listen to the this american life um story about uh 
segregation in schools and achieving yeah. better class outcomes by just sim by literally the only thing you do is you reduce the amount of segregation in schools. Hmm. Uh, it doesn't. It it just like it's very very interesting and very fascinating. And do you uh, know the? Is that a recent one? Uh, yes. Um, say your point, and I will. I will get the exact thing. Very. Um, uh, one second. Just you can. Okay. You can, you can keep. All right. Well, I had a question for you. Yeah. Ask your question. Um, I'm. I'm just. How I'm can just, it, yeah. How can you? How can I ask a question if you're like distracted? No, I'm listening. Like going on your computer. I'm listening. Just, just like in the classrooms. So, um, you know, I teach college, right? And I teach uh, a course every semester. And these are primarily juniors and seniors college. Uh, some every now and then I have a sophomore. Rarely have a freshman. And I'm teaching in the um, the human technology interaction uh, department uh, within the computer science college. Okay. And um, many professors in the in our department uh, and in the school. Um, really liked you know really like the idea of project-based learning right that you don't lecture the whole time mm -hmm. uh, and and I've been experimenting I've been there for a couple of years now and I experiment every semester with different different ways to do the classroom besides me lecturing so um, I do not I, I have a minimal amount of lecturing I do uh, I'm there for the classes I teach, it's once a week for two and a half hours. So there's no way I'm going to lecture for two and a half hours anyway. But I, you know, so I've been experimenting with all different kinds of projects and so on. But there's a certain, um, and, and the students who take my classes, you know, some of them like it, like my approach, and some of them don't. Uh, they tend to get used to me. And if they come back for another class, they kind of, you know, know what to expect. And also they know if they don't like project-based learning they shouldn't sign up for one of my classes so I tend to start getting you know people who like like this project-based learning but there are some students who uh, you know even though these are now these are very computer literate people right they're studying computers yes um, they uh, are very capable of going online and finding information out and, and so on and to a certain extent, they just want, some of them just want to come into the classroom. They just want me to tell them stuff and lecture and tell them what to read and tell them what's going to be on the test. Yeah. And, you know, the idea that they have to, like, do a project yeah. well, or look, do several projects with other students. Yeah, no, 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 I know. They're you like, know, it's yeah, just it like just, rolling their eyes. Well, and, yeah, oh they God, just want to get the credits. The just give me the just give me my degree and I'll already I really So do you think it. part of this is because, you know, I mean they're in college now and they're getting a lot of project based learning, at least at this particular school, but basically they grew up Yeah in, in the other model. Yeah, fourteen years of being pounded to sit in your desk. So do you think eventually if peop if there were this kind of, you know, group and project based learning that people would get used to it and that it, they wouldn't object? I I would yes, I would guess so. I would imagine so, but I, that's, it's almost too abstract for me to, I, I can't, I don't know for sure. And as someone who didn't grow up with project-based learning, really, for most of my life, it's, yeah. it's hard to. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. Really but is. the other big change then that, you know, I think a lot about, because actually the, I work with clients who are in this situation, is the whole idea of um, the university degree. And where that's going, I, and I, I know, know that's changing a lot. And with that's technology, that's a whole other podcast. We should do another podcast because that is also very technology based. Because you've got these, you know, yep. universities, and I've yeah. worked with one of them. Let's just we should stick with high school because this is it's you a wanna, whole. All right, because it, it, it is a whole another podcast. It really all right. Is. Well, can can we can we put that on the list to do? Yeah. So let me talk to okay. you, let me let me talk about the, the This American Life episode. Yeah, go ahead. It's episode 562, The Problem We All Live With. It's um, You can go to This American Life. You can listen to it for free. Um, That's probably fairly recent. Yes, July 31st, 2015. It's a two-part okay. series. Okay. Uh, it's really, really amazing. Um, I'm sure I for, listened to it. For, for 60 years, people have been trying to reinvent education to get yes. poor, especially minority kids, performing as well as kids in really rich white kids in nice schools. 
Mm -hmm. And right, every 10 years, they try something new. They try something new in like the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s yeah. and the 2010s. And um, the gap is essentially the same. It kind of gets a little bigger sometimes. It gets a little smaller sometimes. It depends on the city. It depends on the state. But it's not solved. Yeah. And um, there's one thing that works. And there's a lot of evidence that it really works. And it's just desegregation. Like literally the only factor that you should consider is just trying to make schools as desegregated as possible. As diverse as possible, you mean, in terms of the population? No, no. No. Desegregated specifically, um, right? So when you have, so the problem you face in CPS is you have schools that are like 97% white and oh, then like, oh, and then, and then like 75%, you know, African-American and like 20% Hispanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's okay. and and it's it's really really segre it, it's like like actual segregation. So, um and so the question I pose to our listeners. Yeah. This is how I like to think of it is is there anything in the world that segregation makes better? Well, that and, uh, yeah. And usually, I, ra specifically usually. racial segregation. Is there anything yeah. that makes better? And the answer should probably be no. There's probably nothing that racial segregation makes better. So then the part two is, then you should not be surprised that when you get rid of racial segregation, you see better results. Now, there's, so, I mean, in the re in research on this, and I, I, I did listen to these episodes, but it has been a while. Uh, it's complicated research because remember, there's correlation and there's causation. And there's not a lot of sample size. So we may not know you know why is it but you know Correct. in a way does but it matter and that i think that's their point right <laughs> is that is that you don't need to look at all these other factors it, right all these other factors is it because of this is it because of that it's like it, you know if the research shows it works don't worry about it just, just and do and it. the 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 other the other example uh the sports metaphor for this is there's a um there's there's a couple analytics that uh, analytical stats you know you can do in the analytics right like yes. uh, yards per play or points per yeah. shot or all these different yeah. really advanced stuff but there are a couple an like core analytic stuff that just that just talk about wins and losses right so like wins above yeah. replacement like how many more wins does a team get when this person with the when this is happening versus this yeah. other thing yeah right just x and o's because at the end of the day the only thing that matters is wins right. and losses so right so and you don't you don't care right. you don't care why or if the quarterback right. has intangibles or if he's you know tall or how big his hands yeah. are right like yeah are you winning games or are you not winning games and um so i i just thought that was i thought that was good and people should uh, should listen to it so that was my end. all right so uh so in general i think we're saying we like technology in the classroom uh yeah and we just scratch the surface about we just scratch the surface really. i can tell we may do several yeah we may have we, we may need this. to do a part two just specifically on technology in high school and then yeah. another part three about college right where right technology and colleges and where we're heading yeah. with that because yeah. that gets interesting too yeah um so uh don't be afraid of technology uh don't don't you know if you're if your kids are going to school this year in a school where they're, you know, handing out technology, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's unlikely that that is the only teaching go method being used, so you should be fine as long as there's other things and socialization and project-based learning. Uh, and uh, I think it's always it, it's always okay to bring an apple to your teacher. I <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just um, thought I'd throw in that random idea. The, here, here's the, the other. I just wanted to, to, to kind of finish with a couple broad yes. points. We talked about a lot of things, yes. um, but every student really is a snowflake, and every teacher is a snowflake, and every classroom is a snowflake. You know, and the research on the snowflakes is that they're not that different. Did you, did you, know, did you know that? I didn't say they were that different. I just said they were different. <laughs> but the point but is... But you know the idea about unique snowflakes? That's actually a myth. Okay. No two snowflakes are alike, so I don't know if you. Yeah, want to no, I, 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 sure. It, but there is a certain randomness of the crystallization structure of water when it, okay, when it, pe fine. when a droplet turns into a snowflake. Okay, fine. That does have a large amount of variability. Okay. 
depending on anyway, the moisture content point? in the air and the coldness at which point? it's frozen. <laughs> you know, you, you know, native peoples in you know in like Alaska and northern Canada have like eight in it have like eight different words for snow depending on the different snow type. That might be a myth too, but that, I have yeah, that, <laughs> it's probably a myth too. I know in, in here in Wisconsin, we we have many different a types lot of, of snow. different words for different kinds of snow, different kinds of cold, heavy snow, uh, even just cold, cold snow, cold. like cold snow, like snow that happens when it's very cold. Very different than yeah, it's very different than warm snow. Than warm yeah. snow. Anyway, what was your point? My point is is that you know we talked about a lot of stuff, but um, but. Really, it may just depend on the teacher and the teaching style, and the students, and the way they interact, and the parents, and the culture, and the and the and the culture that the kids, the bat, like the, literally the culture the kids come from, the kids' background, right? Whether their parents natively speak English, how good their English is, uh, whether they have good relationships with, if they have friends at school, or if they're bi oh, bullied yeah. or picked on, and I mean, oh, it's, there is so much. There are so many variabilities. You know, so one many of, variabilities, and that's why it's so of, hard. One piece of research shows that it, um, it, it, a lot of the success in school uh, in the you know public school had to do with the number of kids in the classroom and and you know the class size. And the reason, though, when they finally figured that out, was that in schools that had a small class size, uh, kids did not fall in cracks. Like literally. You feel it? No, like not literally. Pave, like, I mean, oh, figuratively. Oh, okay. So when a kid was Helping. having a, when when there was a problem, right? Somebody somebody was noticing. This is elementary, mm -hmm. middle, and high school, mm -hmm. and that was related to class size. But so it wasn't really the class size. So it's very complicated. Yeah, and it but, depends you know, what you want, right? Do you want your average scores to go up? Do you want the yeah. kids at the top to do the, do you want to have the best kids? Do you want do you, kids to- Or do you want to bring the bottom school, up, right? You want to get rid of the variation. Rates. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it really it's does. Tough. But I, if we have any teachers listening, um, I- Tell would, us what we did wrong. Tell us what we did wrong. We'll put your I comments on air. I just want you to know we support you. Uh, I am very, I'm very appreciative of teachers. And, and I would, I would say in general, you know, having been on the school board and go hug a teacher. No, <laughs> what I know about research. No, I was going to say don't be afraid to experiment. It's okay. No. You know, you well, that's that well the, half the problem is is that well, it's so it's so interesting because for a bunch of years it was going the other way, right? We yeah. actually don't want teachers to experiment. That's why we have common core and all uh, these and and like yeah. these are, this is what you're teaching today and this is the way you're going to teach it but um it i mean recently right with the uh, i mean the obama administration kind of rolling back um the requirements on states to do certain yeah. common core stuff so now it's up to the states and some states might get rid of that in a couple of years so there's lots of lots of changes happening um in that space but yes i i think uh the one thing you can't you can't forget about is that when a teacher is excited about teaching and about the material he or she is teaching, that emotion comes through. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important part of learning. And so whatever you need to do yeah. if you're a teacher to be excited about what you're doing, uh, you know, if you need to experiment, experiment. If you'd rather not experiment, don't experiment. So uh, I'm, yeah. I'm in support. I'm in support. I'm a big teacher. That's totally true. You have you ask people, support. right, like who they're like if they had a teacher that inspired them yeah. kind of growing up. And yeah. it's always like, you know, Mr. Mr. Franzelli, which is a name I totally made up. You know, he you know, he was my science teacher and he was just so excited. And he really yeah. instilled a passion for science in me that I you know, carry with me to this day. Right. He might not be the best teacher in the world, but he, he got me excited. He got about me excited about what now it. what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and that's and that's you just hear that story over and, and over and the computer and, and, and the computer's not gonna do that, okay? The teacher's gonna do that. Ooh. There you go. Ooh. In support of teachers. Part as one. We, as we start the school year, uh, education on human tech part one. Uh, thanks, Guthrie. And let's remind people you want to remind them? If you, you have them? questions, comments, yeah. Yeah. concerns, con considerations, yeah. insight, information, ideas, observations, or Chocolate. general knowledge about anything, 
<laughs> you can email us at info yeah. at the team dot com. Yeah. You can tweet at Susan at It's at the Brain Lady. We post many blogs posts at blog dot the team dot com. We have a Facebook we have page. a Facebook page of the it's the team W and um you know we're doing uh, Instagram now. If you'd like to bring either of us into talk, we talk about many issues we that are a in a much more professional manner than this podcast. <laughs> and I'm quite reasonable, cheap. Susan's more expensive, <laughs> but that's because she's better than me. <laughs> Aw, that was nice. No, that's just because no, my name well, is well known. Yeah, you're well known. And also, you're pretty good. You're, you're pretty good, too. Oh, I appreciate that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Guthrie. Yeah. Keep... Uh, keep sh but actually, can I give everyone homework? Yes. What's the homework? Tell a friend about the podcast. Yeah. You don't you have, have to say you have to listen. You should just be like, if you think it's cool, just text a friend and be like, this I like podcast that. is kind of decent. If you want to waste some time and maybe learn something, check it out. And don't say the and dog then, ate your And homework. then say human tech. All right. Uh, that excuse works much worse in a Chromecast world. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time. Thank you, everyone. I will talk to you soon. Susan, thank you again. Bye.